Hi, Dr. Kat Fleece from Central New Mexico Community College with video F on the urinary system. The emphasis of this video will be on the different capillaries we find in the nephron, and for that we'll also introduce you to the different types of nephrons found in the kidneys. I've mentioned before that on average we supposedly have about a million nephrons per kidney, but there are two types of nephrons. And you've seen me use this image before, Structurally, these two nephrons have the same components, but their location is slightly different, and one of them has a significantly long loop of Henle. So let's give them names first of all. Those nephrons that have their renal corpuscle not sit close to the boundary between our cortex, the C for cortex, and our medulla, we're going to refer to as cortical nephrons, cortical nephrons. And they're the most abundant of all of the nephrons. They don't have a very long loop of Henle, and whatever they have really doesn't dip very far into the medulla. In contrast, our so-called juxtamedullary nephrons, meaning sitting at the junction with the medulla, those juxtamedullary nephrons, they have an extremely long loop of Henle. So that loop of Henle dips far, far, far into our medulla, and there is a reason for that. The reason for this is that these juxtamedullary nephrons, which make up about a fifth or so, give or take, of all of the nephrons in a kidney, they're responsible for helping us really, really concentrate our urine. And we'll talk more about that down the road. These guys, these cortical nephrons, cannot concentrate our urine, um, and they tend to produce more of an isotonic type of urine. And in other words, not a very constant, not a concentrated form of urine, a urine that has the same solute concentration as the blood instead. Now, by having such a very long loop of Henle, that is, these juxtamedullary nephrons, they're also going to have a bit of a change in the appearance of their capillaries that wrap around the loop of Henle. So let's take a look at that. In the juxtamedullary nephrons, these guys that is, we see a different looking capillary bed. So if I attempt to draw this, let's assume that this is our efferent arterial here. What we then see is that the capillary bed very much follows the shape of the loop of Henle, kind of like so. And we see interconnections that are formed between also called the descending and the ascending limb of this capillary bed. Let me finish this real quick. And so, first of all, we refer to this capillary bed as the vasa recta. And if you translate that, Vasa refers to vessel, recta referring to straight. Think of rectus abdominis, referring to your muscles in your abdominal areas where the fibers run straight up and down. So this is a, a capillary bed that also wraps around our loop of Henle, but it looks differently in our juxtamedullary nephrons. It looks like straight tubes this time that are interconnected like so. And this vasa recta plays a very crucial role in helping the nephron, that is our juxt juxtamedullary nephron, create concentrated urine. A very interesting process occurs here at the level of the vasa recta for our filtrate, which becomes eventually urine, to be able to come concentrated. Now we really have to focus more on the glomerulus because it's a very special capillary bed. 
For one, you've already learned that this is a capillary bed in which we see that blood arrives via an arteriole. We refer to it as the afferent arteriole. And I'm going to fix this image because the afferent arteriole needs to have a wider diameter than your efferent arteriole. So this has a wider diameter than the efferent arteriole, this being the efferent arteriole and it having a narrower diameter. So clearly there's something going on with the importance of the different, different diameters, but let's first come back to the fact that this is a capillary bed where blood enters via the art, an arteriole, but it also leaves via an arteriole. So that tells you that the function of this capillary bed is not gas exchange. And of course, you've already learned that the function that occurs here at the level of the renal corpuscle between the glomerulus and the Bowman's capsule is filtration. Now, because we go in and come out via a so-called um, arteriole, we refer to this as a portal system. The differences in the diameters are also going to impact the amount of resistance with which the blood enters the glomerulus. By having a diameter that is wider in the afferent, afferent arterial where our blood is entering into our glomerulus and then having a much more narrow diameter in the efferent arterial where we see blood leaving, we're, we're going to see that within the glomerulus it's going to increase the resistance and that is going to also impact the pressure in the glomerulus. We want that because remember what process occurs here? Filtration. And filtration very much depends on a pressure gradient. So we need to have that higher hydrostatic pressure in the blood compared to the pressure in the Bowman's capsule because that's going to allow for the blood to be pushed through that filtration membrane. Now that pressure gradient allows for filtration to be a passive transport mechanism. There's no use of ATP whatsoever. It's kind of like um, water running from behind the dam where it piled up <clears throat> and then as soon as we create an opening in the dam, the water just rushes through that opening. Uh, it, it was under much higher pressure in front of the dam and now uh, we're letting it out, which is what happens when filtration occurs. This is a rather unusual situation, this kind of a capillary bed in the body. So let's kind of reiterate and perhaps expand on some of the information that I just gave you. So it's really important for the afferent arterial to have a diameter that is bigger than the efferent, efferent arter arterial. If the efferent arterial is narrower, and narrower were, that's a hard word to say, narrower in diameter, it's going to increase the resistance in that arterial. Now, that is important because that is going to allow for the pressure within the glomerulus to build up or to be higher or to increase, I should say. And that is important for the process of filtration to be able to occur. But at the same time, we're going to see that that is also going to allow for the pressure to be somewhat lower downstream into those peritubular capillaries. And that is important again. We don't want to blow out those capillaries. Uh, they're not set up for something called filtration or not as well. Um, they're more designed for uh, the removal of wastes and the providing of nutrients and gas exchange. So if we give some actual numbers to all of these pressures, then the renal arteries <clears throat> tend to have a blood pressure of about 95 um, millimeters of mercury. Remember, and we're looking at um, the highest pressure, so we're kind of, you could kind of compare this to the systolic pressure of the aorta, which would be at about 120. So by the time we get to the renal arteries, we've already lost some of that hydrostatic pressure. Then by the time we get to the blood pressure in the glomeruli, it's close to 55 millimeters of mercury mercury, which is much higher than your other capillary beds in the body, which have an average pressure of 
oh, probably around 20 to 40 millimeters of mercury. And then by the time we get to the renal veins, our pressure is pretty low at about 8 millimeters of mercury. So these significant pressure changes and maintenance of, of a higher pressure in the glomerulus is all due <clears throat> to the anatomy of those afferent and efferent arterioles. Now, in addition to that, these arterioles, just like any others, are very good at vasoconstriction and vasodilation, especially the afferent arterial, since it has a wider diameter, it can narrow significantly. And that, of course, can also influence uh, how much blood enters into the glomerulus and how that impacts the pressure in the glomerulus and how much filtration changes, therefore. Things to think about for the upcoming physiology information that we're going to study. And so, as I mentioned before, your peritubular capillaries, they're really just a big cobweb of capillaries that surround the loop of Henle as well as your convoluted tubules. And they are typically low pressure, like, your, uh, like most of the capillary beds in the rest of the body, very porous. They participate in your um, gas exchange and um, um, exchange of nutrients and wastes, and they pick up quite a bit of the water and solutes, good solutes, that is nutrition uh, solutes, from the filtrate that we're going to learn about as well. We'll also learn more about what we mean by secretion. And then don't forget, in the juxtamedullary nephrons, we might have a little bit of peritubular capillaries uh, around our convoluted tubules, but the majority of the capillary bed is going to be made up of our vasa recta that wraps around that very lengthy, lengthy loop of Henle. Believe it or not, we're still not done with studying the anatomy of nephrons. Uh, there's a special apparatus that we still need to take a look at, which forms right where our distal convoluted tubules meet up with the uh, arterioles, and that particular apparatus has a big influence on the functioning of the nephrons. So that's what we're going to take a look at next.